and we're going to revisit this shortly. <coughs> okay, so p-value, important parts. One is your test statistic, the thing you're calculating your p-value on. The other is some random variable that's going to be drawn, and you're interested in the probability of that random variable, and then your null distribution. And it's either your observed or it's your expected um, statistics under the null hypothesis. So we need to talk about this null distribution a little bit more. It's pretty much the most important part of the p-value, actually. So a lot of times, we want to have an assumed p-value. So remember how we said if we sample 20 people, there's a lot of error in our p-value estimate? Well, that's because if we have assumed p-value and we sample 100 people, this is our like, distribution of what people say. So if I ask the computer under this, we call this a uniform distribution, where each value has the same probability of being generated. So from this distribution, I drew 100 random variables, and then this is a histogram of them. So you can see that, you know, whatever in here in like between 50 and 60, those randomly just got generated a lot more than over here in like the 20, 25 range. And that's because we only did 100 sampling. So if I were to sample 100 people under the uniform distribution, then use this to calculate my p-values, my p-values might not be very accurate. So maybe I could sample 10,000 people. So now my empirical distribution, it's starting to look more like my uniform distribution, but it's still like got some noise. And we can do this all the way up to a million. And at a million, you're like, OK, cool. I'm actually like simulating what this assumed distribution is. So the problem is it takes a really long time to ask a million people what their number between 1 and 100 is. So rather than doing that, I could just be like, you know what? I bet it's going to be a uniform distribution. And so I can just kind of assume a uniform distribution and go with it from there so that I don't actually have to ask everybody. So if there's a uniform distribution and somebody says like 97, I can be like, hey, 97, 98, 99, 100. There's only three values higher than that, so my p-value is like 0.03, right? I don't actually have to go through and count everything up there because I, I kind of know what the probabilities are. However, the problem with assumed distributions is they never quite match real distributions. So this might actually be the real distribution of asking a million people um, for a value between 1 and 100. And as you can see, it's really close to the assumed distribution, but there's a little spike here in the like 65 to 70 range. And that's because as humans, we don't necessarily generate numbers from a uniform uh, distribution. Like for over here, what might explain this little spike? Yes. It's close. 50 is right there. It's actually between like 65 and 70, I think. At least I think it's supposed to be between like 65 and 70. So what numbers between 65 and 70 that might become overrepresented if you ask humans instead of a computer to generate numbers? Yeah, let's work through them. We got 65. 66, 67, 68, 69, and 70, right? Are a lot of people going to say 69, right? Because humans actually aren't computers. They don't generate these numbers from a random thing. There are certain numbers that, for cultural reasons, might just be overly said. So in this case, the real distribution might not match our assumed distribution. So the real question is, do we care? Are we actually willing to take the time and effort to figure out what the true distribution is, or we just want to assume one? We're just going to assume it, right? So that is the difference between a real and assumed. And the cool part is there's lots of assumed distributions, and they usually all follow nice mathematical properties, which we can learn about. The most important one to learn about is the normal distribution. This is the workhorse of distributions in pretty much all sciences. And a normal distribution is parameterized by two things, its mean and its standard deviation. And how you interpret these is on the x-axis is the test statistics. So we called it S0 for S observed. Here they're just going to call it this x value. And so if we just focus on this blue one right now, what this says is if you were to generate 
a value from this blue distribution, it would have the highest likelihood of being generated here at zero, and then like a pretty small probability of being generated at negative one, and then almost no probability of being generated at like negative two, three, or four, and same thing on the other side. So the mean value that you expect to be generated is given by this mu, and then over here you have the variance, and the variance tells you how dispersed the distribution is. So the difference between the blue, the red, and the orange one here isn't that their mean has changed, but rather that their variance has changed. So if you compare it to the blue to the orange, the orange has a, a variance of five. And what that means is the difference between generating, a, the probability of generating a five or a zero and generating a two isn't really all that different. So it can really generate these numbers further away from the mean without much problem. Whereas on the blue, getting out here to a two, you're basically just like not gonna generate it. Um, and then you can also shift the mean around, which is what you see in the green one there. And given on the y-axis is just the probability of observing that. So I could say, here's a one, on blue the probability of observing this is like pretty small over there. Um, all right, so these normal distributions, we really love them because a lot of things just randomly happen to follow normal distributions. It's not actually that random, it actually follows some cool math. But anyways, um, we saw before that this is like the distribution of height in the human population, and it also conveniently is basically a normal distribution. Here we have on the x-axis the percent daily change in oil price, and the y is just a number of days, so every day they look how much the percent of oil change in oil price is, and they plot a histogram of it and it follows this normal distribution centered around like 0.03%. And uh, very conveniently for us, if you have a bunch of phenotypes Y and a bunch of genetics represented by X and you wanna ask what's the effect of X on Y, you can estimate what the effect size is beta and your estimate of the effect size will be centered. So the mu is gonna equal the true effect and then there'll be some standard deviation on that. <clears throat> and so when we fit these equations, all of our residuals and our noise and our error terms and our standard deviations and our confidence intervals are all gonna be based on these normal distributions. All right, so how do we actually get a p-value from a normal distribution? So a lot of times, so here's our normal and it's centered at mu and then these vertical bars here represent um, standard deviations away from, uh, away from mu. And again, the standard deviation is related to the variance and just kind of relates to how spread out the data is. And regardless of what normal distribution you look at, if you look at all of the possible values your test statistic can come on that are between mu minus a standard deviation and mu plus a standard deviation, 68.27% of the time, if you generate a random value along this x-axis, it's gonna fall between these two values, right? So let's say I observe mu minus the standard deviation as my test statistic. And for evaluating how extreme something is, I just wanna know um, absolute distance from the mean. In that case, what percentage of all the possible things are further away in absolute terms from the center mu than our point right there. So what about closer? So if we're mu minus sigma, is the point right here equally distant from mu, right? So anything in here is closer to the mean than our value. And anything outside of this is further from the mean. And so what we want, if we wanna know, if extreme is further from the mean, then what we wanna know is how much of this area is over here versus over there. And we know that within the standard deviations, it's 98.23%. So that means outside of this like pink zone is 30, 31.7% of the data. Who have I lost here? I feel like I've got to have lost somebody. All right, 
So if you observe this value here, it's going to have a p-value of 31.7 because 31.7 of the values are further away from that mean point. All right, what if I observe this guy here? If I observe some test statistic equaling mu plus two standard deviations, how much of the data is less extreme than that value? Say again? Yeah, 95, because right here, this much of the data all is less distant from this mean. And so if you do one minus this, it tells you how extreme things are on the outside. So that's one way when things follow a normal distribution, you can figure out like what's actually the p-value on, uh, on calculating these.